my first question, which is, um, you know, us reading this book um, in the region, it speaks a lot to us. We understand the message, um, and, and it sort of, uh, as I said, encompasses the way the ecosystem has evolved over time. So the audience um, that the book was written for, it was very well received in the region, but who did you have in mind when you first set out to read this book? And how, how, uh, how did that change after you published the book? And, and did you discover anything new about who else your book speaks to? So I think that if you had asked me the question at the time that I was right, or made the sure, decision to exactly, write it, yeah. the, 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 literally what I remember saying to, to, to a friend of mine at the time was, if one person reads this book in the West or America and has the, yeah. the view that I was able to have, sure. and if one young person in the Middle East goes to their parents and shows them the book, mm -hmm. and then the parents say, yes, you should be doing this, sure. and then I feel like I've accomplished something. Yeah. And, I was quite surprised that it sold as much as it did, and how, you know, with this Donald Trump bullshit going on and things now, it is amazing how, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> but the fact is that, that in this nonsense, yeah. this book is incredibly well received. And by the sure. way, in America, I have talked from places like, like universities in, um, in uh, any major city sure. that you can imagine. I've talked to Silicon Valley mm -hmm. in any way that you can imagine. Uni one of the best audience I ever had of the most engaged questions was University of Alabama. <laughs> okay. and it was just, it was 300 Down people. Down south. Deep south of America, <laughs> and they asked great questions, and they were very curious, and particularly a new generation resonated with what was going on, and that was very moving. And then the other thing that was very moving was when I would come to the region and talk about the book, and particularly, I think, when the book came out in Arabic, I just had people coming up to me saying, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. Nice. You know, and that, that to me was very different audiences for different reasons, but came to similar epiphanies. And I think, honestly, Ferris, the epiphany was it makes sense. Absolutely. Just, I read it, I'm like, well, of course, this is happening everywhere. Yeah. It makes sense. P power of hindsight. Yes. Um, so how was your book received? So I know since you've written the book, there's been uh, a lot of... Uh, funds, I would say, or uh, 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 people in the tech industry, individuals as well as entities in the tech industry in the West who have, um, you know, b begun to appear more and more out here. You know, obviously have 500 startups, yeah. uh, and we have others as well. How was your book received? I know your, the foreword was written by Mark Andreessen, who is uh, uh, a partner, managing partner, and general partner at uh, Andreessen Oro. It's one of the largest uh, venture capital funds in the West. How how was the reception? To, uh, to this book out there, and has it changed sort of uh, the West's perception of us? So there are different audiences in the West that come at this in a very different way, right? So the Silicon Valley audience, I think literally the first reaction was Andreessen writing the forward was actually sure. quite helpful. Yep. And Mark, some of you have heard of, I mean, he invented the browser, and then he built a company called Netscape that was very successful. And as Ferris touched on, he's one of the, you know, arguably their firm is one of the three or four most important uh, venture capital firms in uh, uh, Silicon Valley, and Mark's general view of it, and why I think he wrote the forward, was that he has understood that this phenomenon of universal access of technology is just never, ever, ever going back. And, you know, we stop and take this for granted as we think about it, but it's really a very powerful thought, which is the smartphone in your pocket right now has literally the same computing power that all of NASA had in 1969 to uh, put a man on the moon. And when you start realizing that, you know, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, by the end of the decade, 70% of people everywhere, and including the Middle East, and in some parts of the Middle East already beyond this, are going to be walking around in the world with effectively a supercomputer in their person, it is going to open up entirely new conversations about the way to think about engaging in the sure. world. And so... Brings transparency. It, it, absolute transparency. At the same time, it's a very interesting how Silicon Valley, for all of its openness to new ideas and innovation and all, is still very locked down in their own narrative. Sure. Not only about what happens in Silicon Valley, but very often they think about um, growth markets generally, not just the Middle East, but any growth market, as a place to take advantage. I mean, not take advantage, it's too harsh. But, you know, if I can outsource cheaply, I will go there. If a market's like China or India, it's so big, I'll go there because I have to go there and me, 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 me. And all of a sudden they're thinking to themselves, well, wait a minute, we're not as needed anymore. Sure. Because these markets are growing in their own right, and very powerful changes are happening. I can't prove this to you, but I think that in some respects, Alibaba going public, the big e-commerce company sure. from China, which was the largest publicly traded offering ever in history, the big news was not that a Chinese company, tech-enabled, went public. The big news was the largest IPO in history went public by a business that was built almost without the West at all. Sure. And this is a very, very big deal to these guys. 
And so I think that in part Mark's thing, in part because the book resonated with so many people, and in part because a lot of people looked around the world and saying the world is shifting in very powerful and frankly exciting ways, yeah. they changed their view. So, that, so it's yeah. going slowly, but it's happening. I understand. So um, my, my colleague Khaled Talhouni, who's the managing partner at Tomda Capital and I, attended a course in May, uh, yeah. joint, jointly uh, hosted by 500 startups in Stanford. So emerging markets is kind of one of the buzzwords you see in the, in the valley, but um, that mostly refers to South America, specifically Brazil. It refers to China, refers to India. Um, it, it also could refer to Russia to some extent. Um, so where does the Middle East fit into that? What is, is there a tangible interest um, in the Middle East? Or is it, uh, and, and, and does that mean it's, it's something that can be translated into something uh, that the, the region and the West can benefit from? Or is it just interest, you know, okay, we, we can see it from far. We read Chris's book. You know, the region looks great, but it's not our priority. It's a wonderful question. And I think there may be three or four <laughs> categories of people we're thinking about. There's some people who, again, will throw out emerging markets like it's a buzzword and, and sure. what have you. There are investors who ran and rushed in, and frankly, they've lost a lot of money, right? There was this period of time when we talked about the BRICS. Yeah. And first of all, Brazil's been having significant difficulties, obviously, sure. in the last Turkey year. Turkey as well. And, Tur and Turkey's Russia. had its challenge. Russia, you know, which frankly could have been one of the great ecosystems on Earth, you know, yeah. governments there made different decisions, yeah. and it's not what it could have been. Sure. But a little secret that people don't talk a lot about is that most Silicon Valley firms that tried to go to China have lost a tremendous amount of money. Sure. I mean, a couple of people like Sequoia. O overvaluation. Overvaluation, but this is, this is the more important thing. Sure. And this goes to your point about the Middle East and everything else. Going into these markets is not, we're the gringo Silicon Valley guys, aren't sure. you happy that we're here? It is long-term relationship building, sure. partnership building, Things will go up, things will go down, understanding ecosystems. It's truly about co-authorship. Sure. So the smart, the fourth bucket mm -hmm. of people that I see in Silicon Valley, I put McClure a little bit in this category, sure. but there are others who are saying, this is going to take a lot of time. We're going to spend time working with people because mm -hmm. the macro phenomenon of universal access and the rising of middle class in many countries are going to be very powerful. Sure. But it's going to take time and investment and co-authorship. Okay. It's not about us to them, but something that's combined together. And Dave is the leader. You folks have seen here that there's a wonderful guy from Y Combinator here. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful guy here from 1776. And I think that we're going to see a greater momentum of more patient capital who realize that it's a, just a new world of innovation and it takes a different kind of approach. Absolutely. Um, so what are some unexpected outcomes that uh, you've seen as a result of publishing this book? So well, you, you gave us a better picture of what um, you had in mind when you first set out to write the book. What are some unexpected outcomes? that came as a result of it. So when I wrote this book, there's a friend of mine in the book publishing industry, he'd been there like for 30 years, and knows pretty much everything about the American book business that you could know. And uh, he said to me, you truly are an entrepreneur and a contrarian. He said, because in 30 years in the book business, there are only two books that never sell. And one book is a book on uh, entrepreneurship uh, and innovation, and other book is about uh, the Middle East. Okay. And you put them all together in one book, he said, I'm very impressed by you. Uh, the book online... And he published, he still published it. He, he actually advised and helped it in every event, because I think people thought this was part of a bigger story, yeah. and, and it could be something that was different in all the one-sided narrative in, um, in the West. And look, it's very, very interesting about this, because there were people in the Western media, people like Charlie Rose and Fareed Zakaria, uh, David Ignatius of the Washington Post and a whole bunch of blogs and tech people that really embraced it. And there were a bunch of people who just said this isn't real. Embrace like, the narrative. Embrace mean. the narrative. Yeah, okay. but for, forget right. the book. I mean, the book is a reflection no, of no, the narrative. No, I understand. But the narrative. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then there were other folks who just simply just wouldn't touch it. I mean, sure. they just really had no interest of it at all. The quantity of interest, interest that yeah. bubbled up bottom up, because mm -hmm. the book has sold tens of thousands of copies, which for a book of this nature is actually very large sure. and much bigger than anyone had expected, sure. both in English and Arabic and audio. Um, that was refreshing to me, and that's why it gives me hope, because it just tells me that there are lots of people who want to look at things in a much more practical, logical, truth sure. basis, as opposed to the one narrative that sometimes sure. we get stuck in. So, um, the book is about the ecosystem. Um, how has the ecosystem evolved, in your opinion? Because you've been back here a few times since, um, and, and you get to see some of the pipeline we see at Wanda Capital. So how, how has the ecosystem evolved since you've published the book? So I'll say something as an anecdote and then bring it to more analytics and this kind of thing. When I was at the celebration of entrepreneurship that Fadi and the others did, they would always have these breakout sessions or these unconference sessions. 
and you'd be at tables of maybe 10 or 12 people, whatever it is, talking about different issues. And they'd bring in someone who's been there before to talk about things at the different tables. Endeavor does these and everything sure. else. Four years ago, I can tell you that often, whoever was the entrepreneur in residence of the discussion, like she or he would do all the talking. And sure. the table would take copious notes and ask a couple of questions, that's the end of it. About a month and a half ago, I went to a gathering like this in, there in Dubai, and the, the panelists was irrelevant. Sure. This was an inflamed group of passionate people mm -hmm. who now have been building things over four years, who are mm -hmm. helping each other, teaching each other, autodidact, bottom mm -hmm. up. And that's not only an interesting reflection almost of a kind of a cultural shift that I saw, but the quantity and quality of assets that I've seen sure. across the regions have been, I mean, much better. I mean, one of the kind of marks, if you read the book, you know, almost 70% of the companies that are in the book are either still alive or have raised a boatload of money and have done much better and bigger than, than we have thought. There's no sure. venture capital portfolio mm -hmm. that has 70% of the companies who two, three years later are still doing really interesting things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a confidence and a courage and a quality both of presentation and thinking across the region which is very powerful. Now one of the things that Americans always do is they think of the region as a region, right? Like Americans will call Africa, Africa, and say that Ghana and Nigeria and Kenya all fit into this. Things are very different place to place. I mean, remember, when I wrote the book, I had been in Damascus in January of 2011 and saw some of the most creative, amazing young entrepreneurs I saw anywhere, and obviously the regime made terrible choices in, in exchange for that. Dubai ra has risen much faster and quicker in a lever, the, yeah. in level of quality and is a magnet to talent because yeah. among other things, they've taken so seriously changing some rule of law and making life sure. better in that. So it's a long way to go. But it's a, it is a yeah. long, long way to go, but I think what, it's, what people, I, I hear this too often, I think, when I talk particularly even entrepreneurs here, I think in the truth that there is a long way to go, people do not appreciate how far it has come. <clears throat> Yeah, and that to me is in a way the yeah. headline of it, it all. It, it takes a, it takes an outside perspective to to kind of put things into perspective. Well, in perhaps it's easier progress. for me to yeah. fly in yeah, periodically exactly. yeah, and say yeah. that, but yeah. it, it is nonetheless true. No, I, I understand. Um, uh, but we we also have okay. So the problem with or not the problem, the the nature of the way we work is we're kind of in this region and we understand the dynamic from our perspective. We have the benefit of hearing your perspective as someone who's been to Iran. Uh, has been to Turkey, has been to all these other regions, but in specific Iran, our perspective is, you know, you, you, it's, it's the media narrative, much like what the media narrative is uh, like about the region in the West. Uh, it's a hostile nation, whatnot. We understand they, have, they might have some tech, but we all know it's opening up. Um, is there room for the region, meaning the Arab world, Arab-speaking countries, to work with Iran? Um, and by that, I mean, are there, are there opportunities for entrepreneurs to, to, to see uh, each other's markets? Um, and, and the other way around, so for investment as well, is there opportunity to, to cross-invest? So in the last year, I've been to Iran twice. Yeah. These are, are fascinating trips, but they're sure. also limited and narrow in yeah. the control. So take everything with that lens of what's sure. happening. What, what I'd say is maybe three takeaways. First is, everything I talked about, about universal access of technology and a new generation making things happen with it was, is absolutely true in Iran, is any place that we find in the world sure. here. And Especially I mean, in Iran, because it, well, they've been so isolated, they have so much catching up to do. Well, this is the, this is the point where I'll, I'll make it in a yeah. second, but just to underscore the point there. I mean, you know, there's, there are 80 million people or so in Iran, uh, broadband penetration, Wi-Fi mostly, is like 65, 68 percent. Credit card penetration as well. Credit card penetration, there's not the COD sure. issue of that kind of a thing. Um, smartphone penetration is 50 percent. One of the things educated that, population. One yeah. of the things that blew me away was the first time I went, there wasn't a lot of 3G, 4G. Sure. And in fact, they said they were going to roll out 3G, 4G, mm -hmm. and a couple of the business types said they'll never do it. The regime will never allow it. Sure. And I went back a year later, and there's 25, and there. 25 yeah. million 3G subscribers. Nice. <laughs> so this is all on the potential side of it. Um, in many respects, the way that you were touching on it before, I think the environment's about five years behind what I'm seeing in places like Egypt and Dubai and, really? and Lebanon. Yeah. In that, in, in what sense? There's very little. Well, there's a couple of things. There's very little capital. There's very little. Uh, there are sure. now the amazing. Uh, uh, Avatech and a few others are just sure. doing amazing things in the sort of startup stuff. There are a few angel investors, more are coming. Um, but, you know, the, the, this transition that is going on is still quite uncertain. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of challenges in the country. The infrastructure is there sure. in many ways because there is a technology, there is the acceptance of technology, as you alluded to before, mm -hmm. some of the best engineering uh, students I've ever seen sure. anywhere. But the fact is that the weight of what they're transitioning out of is still very, very profound, sure. and they're still very nascent. 
Now, I will tell you that if things were to open up in a good way, which we cannot predict yet how that will happen, um, it will move very, very quickly. I okay. think they will move into the world economy as entrepreneurs and as tech um, much, much more quickly than any growth market up until sure. now. And so what does that mean to the Arab world then? So there was an interesting thing that was also generational that I heard there. I mean, obviously, there is a... a, a I'm not even sure how to, to, to hit this lightly, but hit it sensitively. <laughs> there, are, there are cultural <laughs> distinctions sure. that manifest themselves in sometimes very passionate and very direct and very blunt ways that were actually almost put me back on my heels. Okay. But what I would tell you is that most of that was generational. Okay. Meaning that when I was with, again, the young people, all of whom had VPN, all of whom are on Snapchat, all of whom are taking courses on Coursera, many of whom who have been to many parts of the Middle East are just like, where there's talent, there's talent. Sure. I mean, look, that's, in, in a lot of respects, Ferris, the story that is so underappreciated by much of the media today yeah. is this construct that it's not like history doesn't matter. It yeah. does. It's not that culture distinctions don't matter, that they do. They do. But at the same time, there is this window where people are seeing other folks in very different interesting ways where they can actually co-author ideas based on the talent and the veracity of those ideas. Excellent. Great. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Buddy. It's such a pleasure. No, it's so good to, to see you again.